The science of chemistry has disappointed many people. It upset the emperor of China in the year 59 BC. He had been told that one of his court officials, Liu Xiang, could make gold. A great feast was organized, at the end of which Liu Xiang was to prepare a small quantity of the precious metal. After toiling away with complicated apparatus for several hours, all he succeeded in producing was an unpleasant smell. Liu Xiang was executed on the spot. This true story reflects one of the problems that has confronted people since the dawn of time. The problem being an understanding of how substances change into different substances. Today, the phenomenon of substances changing into different substances has evolved into the grand science of chemistry. So what is chemistry? Chemistry is the science of substances and how they turn into different substances. And very frequently, we can recognize a chemical change because there is a change of color. As I pour my chemical waters from one flask to another, you'll notice they're changing color. And the reason why they're changing color is because every time I'm making a new substance. Thanks to the science of chemistry, today we live in a world of fantastic products. Thanks to the science of chemistry, we have purified drinking water from our taps. Thanks to the science of chemistry, we have plastics, polymers, glues, dye stuffs, adhesives, sealants. We have toothpaste, we have dental materials that the dentist uses. We have fuels, explosives, agricultural chemicals. We have perfumes, shampoos, shower gels, detergents, a whole range of remarkable substances that we use on an everyday basis, all thanks to the science of chemistry. Chemistry, the science of substances and how they turn into different substances. And in these examples here, I've mixed some chemical waters together and I've showed you an example of a chemical change. But now I wanted to show you an example of a different type of water, which I have here in my thermos flask. And this type of water has, is known by the magicians as magic disappearing water. If I now throw some of this up into the air and look at it like that, stand under it, don't look for it, you won't see it because it's disappeared into thin air. And the reason why it's disappeared into thin air is because that is precisely what this is made of. This represents one of the greatest triumphs of the science science of physics. It is indeed, it's liquid nitrogen, and as the liquid nitrogen boils away, it is rapidly um, turning to a gas. The liquid here is boiling. The boiling point of liquid nitrogen is minus 196 degrees centigrade. And in order to achieve these remarkable temperatures, we had to employ the science of physics using principles of latent heat of vaporization, which I won't go into now. Now, as you'll notice, the liquid nitrogen is consistently boiling away. And as it boils, it expands enormously, as I will shortly demonstrate. I am now going to place some liquid nitrogen into three bottles which I have here. They're, they're plastics drinks bottles. And I'm then going to do something which you should never ever do with a boiling liquid, and that is to enclose it in a sealed container. And the reason why you should never do that is because when liquids boil, they undergo a huge coefficient of expansion. They expand in volume by a factor of about 800. What I'm doing here, I am pouring in um, approximately 100 milliliters of liquid nitrogen into each of these bottles here. Some of it's missing, it doesn't matter, it falls on the floor, it rapidly boils away. And indeed, the steam which you can see is, a, is water vapor in the atmosphere which is, condensing, which is condensing to tiny droplets of water. It is literally a sort of a mist or a, or a cold steam. So, I have now... Um, poured some of my liquid nitrogen. I'll just top up a tiny little bit more. Perhaps I do have a, 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 few, a few bottles of this. And I have to take great care, of course, because, it, because of its great, very, very low temperature, there is a significant chance of frostbite if I was in contact with it for more than a few split seconds. So we now have some liquid nitrogen in each of these three bottles. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something which I said you should never, ever do, and that is to seal them as the liquid with nitrogen is boiling. Now, clearly, it would make sense to have some insulating gloves, which I have here. And, whoops, a daisy, sorry, wrong hand. And what I'm going to do now is just very quickly to put the top on very, very, very tightly. Now, what I wanted to say is that the, the 
um, liquid expands by a factor of about 800. So if I've got, um, let's say, 100 centimeters cubed of liquid nitrogen in each of those bottles, then when that liquid nitrogen boils away, it will give us approximately 80 liters. 80 liters, which is, of course, a, a very, very vast amount indeed um, compared to the size of the bottle, which is half a liter. So that, when it boils, will generate a, pre a pressure of approximately 160 atmospheres, which is far more than this could possibly bottle could withstand. So it takes about five minutes or so, you may hear a very loud bang. And that's because, so I'm warning you in advance that this may happen. Sometimes the bottles are not sealed. They don't, the, the um, so I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just doing the top as tightly as I can. You may, by the way, just for fun, try and guess which of these lids, they are three different sized dustbins, see if you can predict which of the lids will go the highest. Now, I am now, I am now going to carry on and one of the very, very important ideas with um, liquid nitrogen and low temperatures is the fact that there is very little energy associated at low temperatures. And what I wanted to do is to do a, do a couple of demonstrations, and I'm going to start off very quickly by just doing the obvious one, which is to freeze some water. So I'm pouring a small quantity of water, uh, drinking water, from my, uh, from my bottle here, and I'm going to cover it with liquid nitrogen. Now, when I've covered it with liquid nitrogen, you'll notice a huge amount. I'm just going to stand this on a tripod so you can see it clearly. And you'll notice a huge amount of steam coming off, cold steam once again. And I'm just going to pour this on like this. Now, this is a most interesting experiment from the domain of physics because we have mixed together two colorless liquids. Now, unlike these experiments there where I was mixing two colorless liquids and making another substance and there was a color change, here I am making two different states of matter. Here we have two liquids mixed together and one of them is boiling away to give a gas and the other one is freezing to a solid. Now, for that reason, this is the most interesting experiment in the domain of physics because it concerns all three states of matter, which are solid, which will be the ice, liquid, liquid nitrogen, liquid water, and the gas, which will be the gaseous nitrogen, which will be produced. Now, as liquid nitrogen, uh, as the water freezes, should I say, and the liquid nitrogen boils away, you may hear some slight crackling. And the reason why we hear crackling is because water expands as it freezes. You can start hearing the crackling now. And when, this, uh, when water expands, it sets up huge stresses between the crystals, among the crystals there. So I, um, there is a small chance that you may hear some crackling. It might get louder, and you may hear a louder bang. But I'm going to allow that to carry on, then, then the glass will shatter, you see. But I'm going to carry on on the theme of low energy. Here you see a piece of rubber tubing. It's elastic and the reason why it's elastic from a thermodynamic point of view is because there's lots of heat, there's at a high temperature, and the molecules inside, they can move around quite vigorously. However, if I now lower my, lower my, um, lower my rubber tube into the thermos flask of liquid nitrogen, please watch carefully what happens. And now you see a magnificent fountain of liquid nitrogen. Now, this is generated for the same reason that the bottles, there you are, that's cracking sound. That was the sound of the beaker having been shattered by the expansion of the water which was freezing. And we'll come back to that in just a second. So the reason why we had this shower of liquid nitrogen is because the liquid nitrogen inside the tube was boiling. As it was boiling, it was hugely expanding. And therefore, that led to the, um, the pressure being set up and causing it to shoot out here. Now, now you see, in those bottles... In those bottles, it didn't have anywhere to go, which is why the bottle exploded. I was about to tell you that, but I was beaten to it by the dustbin. But I hope you won't mind. Now, if you don't mind, just let me show you. This is now no longer, no longer an elastic solid. It's become very brittle. And if I whack it one on this table, you'll notice it shatters into a thousand fragments. It shatters into a thousand fragments because the, the energy of these molecules is very low at low temperature. Normally, well, there you are. Now, normally, at warm temperatures, we all have lots of energy. We're all doing this, you see. And so the molecules in here. But at low temperatures, suddenly they freeze. They do this. 
they stop moving because of the low temperature. Now, another demonstration. In the meantime, we can have a quick look. We can have a quick look at our beaker. Oh dear, water has flown all around, all around the, the outside of the beaker, and I shall pour in more liquid nitrogen to make sure I can freeze all that water. While that is freezing, I'll pop this down here, then I shall now, very quickly, I shall now, excuse me, I'm just trying to get it up. Let me put it there. And now, just show you another experiment. This balloon here has air in it at a, quite a decent pressure. It's been blown up by my lungs, slightly above atmospheric pressure. Why has it got pressure? Because the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen in the air are moving around. As the molecules are moving around, they have energy and they bump into, they have velocity, and as they bump into the membrane of the balloon on the inside, they exert a pressure. And that is by virtue of its temperature. It's very warm. It's warm in here, about 22 degrees centigrade. Now, I'm going to cool down the molecules. I'm going to call down the balloon. And as I call down the balloon, you'll notice it starts to shrink. And the reason why the balloon is starting to shrink is because it's getting colder. And why is it, why is it, uh, when it's getting colder, this is the important point, the molecules have less energy. The molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, which normally move around very, very rapidly, they stop moving, they stop moving, or they move very slowly, and consequently, the balloon collapses. I'm just going to pour some more. We've got plenty more liquid nitrogen just to collapse the balloon as much as I possibly can because I do want to show you we can do this. Now, this huge contraction, this huge variation in the volume of a gas with temperature is exploited every day in all sorts of machines, etc., and from refrigerators, etc. But that's not to worry. Please watch carefully as I now be very this is a reversible change. As I throw this up into the air, the balloon will gradually be restored to its former shape. And the reason why it's restored to its former shape is because this change is reversible. The molecules, as they gain more energy inside, they move more rapidly, and therefore they're able to exert a greater pressure. And now we'll just have a quick look to see what's happened. Whoops, Daisy, sorry, we're all over the place here, but we'll get a result. I just wanted to see what's happened to this beaker. Oh, can you see that? It's frozen, isn't that amazing? It's frozen to the mat. I've picked the mat up because the beaker, the water, as it came out, it was it hit crack, and we could now just pour off the excess. And there you see the beaker has frozen because as the water came out, it has used its molecular, intermolecular forces, and it is therefore causing that. It has caused a very strong bond to be made. And now, very quickly, my favorite topic, of course, I told you, chemistry and fire is one of the most important. Oh, dear me. I've blown out the flame. Silly Shidlow, I'm talking too much and too fast, so I now have to put my candle on. Fire, a flame like this, represents one of the greatest triumphs of the early civilizations, for it was in East Africa 100,000 years ago that people were able to make flames like this and to sustain them. And for two, until 250 years ago, this was the only type of flame known to the human race. Until about 250 years ago, when one of the greatest discoveries it was made of our civilization, of our human race, and that is the fact that air is a mixture of gases. We recognize that oxygen is the gas that makes things burn better, and nitrogen is the part of the air that doesn't make burn. So I wanted just to show you, when scientists knew that, they knew how to exploit oxygen. I just wanted to make things burn better. Notice this is a piece of cotton wool burning in air. Absolutely useless. It's not spectacular, and the reason why it's burning like this is because the cotton is surrounded by air. Air contains one-fifth oxygen, and so this process here is known as incomplete combustion. It's rather slow. I now pop this into my beaker of water here, and now I'm going to take out for you a piece of cotton that has been burnt, that has had oxygen chemically combined with it. Please watch carefully as I set fire to this and see if you can spot the difference. This is cotton chemically combined with extra oxygen. And there you see a much more rapid combustion. What I've demonstrated for you is a high explosive known as gun cotton. And I'm now going to use a small piece of this gun cotton to fire, to uh, fire to propel some ping pong balls using my mortar here. Now, time is running out, so I'm just going to quickly drop this in down here. Excuse me, I'm going to drop this in like this. I've got to set up a fuse. Uh, my fuse has to be, let me watch. There it goes. Now, four ping pong balls. One, two, three, and four. Quickly stand, put the stand on here. A little fuse in there. 
and hopefully we'll watch the ping pong balls take off. Now I must do this out of range of those uh, balloons because those balloons could do something quite nasty if I was to get too close to them. So please excuse me, I'm just going to put a fuse in here, I'm going to light it and then I'm going to run on to my next experiment which concern the red balloon and the blue balloon which are quite highly up in the air. So this is an example of man's understanding of how oxygen makes things burn better and I have put in a small piece of gum cotton which will act as a propellant, hopefully the ping pong balls will come out. And now, there we are, ping pong balls have hit the ceiling, a demonstration of chemistry in action. Now here, I have a balloon which is filled with hydrogen, which is the lightest gas in the universe, discovered by Henry Cavendish in 1766. And here, I just wanted to show you when it burns, it just burns in air with a very simple pump like this, nothing special. But here, I have a balloon which is filled with a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. This balloon is filled with a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, aria tonante, thunder air, as Pilatre de Rose you used to call it. So listen to this loud bang and it makes a tiny puff of water. So there it is. And now, very quickly, final experiment coming up here. I have, as you know, hydrogen is very popular uh, as a fuel, potentially as a fuel. It's been in the news and it will continue to be in the news. And that's why I'm showing you some experiments to just to show you what a colossal amount of energy hydrogen release, releases when it burns. Now, what I've got here is two hydrogen oxygen balloons like that. They will make an enormous bang, so you have a bit of warmth. I'm also, in, in, in addition to the bang, I'm going to add a tiny little bit of a mixture of flash powder. This is a mixture of magnesium powder and potassium nitrate, and, it, and it's, it's, it's used in pyrotechnic devices for a flash, and I'm going to just pour a little bit on there just to liven up the, the performance here for the end, <laughs> and then I think I'll just, let's just sprinkle some of there, and now just to finish off, what have I been talking about? Chemistry. What have I been selling to you all? Chemistry. In plain and simple language, chemistry for all. So there it is. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, much Andrew. My pleasure. My <laughs> I'm sorry, there's a bit of dust flying no, around. No, that's all right. Yeah, that's, that's magnesium all right. Magnesium oxide is quite harmless. Oh, all right. Fantastic. I'm, I'm not worried then anymore. Uh, why? So we talked about this. I mean, why aren't more chemistry lessons like this? Or, I mean, not um, everyone has to have an explosion. Do you but. know what? I used to, this is how I learned school in, back in the 1950s. So um, it's, uh, education has changed in the 1950s, mm -hmm. uh, but I've still survived. I've survived, and I mm -hmm. continue to do so. And that's why I carry on doing these experiments. Mm -hmm. But that's not a job for me to answer. I'm just a chemistry teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm not an educationist. I'm not a curriculum developer. Mm -hmm. I'm not a politician. So that's the, the reason. But um, I think no one will dispute that this was this is the sort of chemistry that I grew up with as mm -hmm. a child uh, um, at Latimer Upper School in Hammersmith in Shepherds Bush. Well, we have fantastic chemistry teachers. And, oh, look, there are thousands of chemistry teachers today still, but I suspect that the program of education which they have is probably devoid of a, of a lot of this material. Mm. Well, Andrew, thank you so much. It's my greatest privilege. For visiting us and uh, for showing us a little bit about what chemistry can do. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>